Hi, this is Scott. Welcome to The Tall Woodworker. In this video, I'm going to make a chaotic pattern end grain cutting board. Stick around, I'll show you how it's done. So a couple videos ago, I did an edge grain cutting board that I made for my mother and mother-in-law. They both loved them, by the way. They were blown away with how they look. Hopefully they're using them. I told them that it's not a wall decoration. They should be using them. In this video, I'm going to kick it up, not just one notch, but actually a few notches. Most of the time, people would say that the next version of a cutting board is an end grain cutting board. And I have made one of those about a year ago. In this video, I'm going to create a chaotic pattern. It's a little complex on how to do, but if you watch enough people do it, it's fairly straightforward. Just pay attention to what you're doing. I'm going to use some of the usual suspects for woods, such as maple, ash, cherry, and of course, walnut, because every project I have has to have walnut in it somewhere. And then we're gonna throw in some exotics for color as well. So we've got purple heart, paduke, and wenge. This will create a really cool set of colors. And in fact, in addition to these three foot boards, I still have a whole bunch of cutoffs from other projects that I can incorporate into this as well. And that's the great thing about not just cutting boards, but especially these chaotic patterns, is you can integrate a board that's as small as this into your design if you do it correctly. We're going to get started on this. I have no idea how it's going to turn out. I've never done one of these, and the main idea is chaos. There is no pattern. If you start making a pattern, you're doing it wrong. Now, before I get started, if you haven't already, please subscribe to my channel. Uh, I've got some pretty interesting videos coming up that uh, hopefully you would be interested in. Make sure you hit that bell so you get notifications when I post new videos. And leave a comment, as always, below. Tell me what you like about my projects, tell me what you dislike, and tell me if there's anything you want me to think about for a future project. But for right now, let's get cutting. Step one, we're gonna take all our boards and rip them down to the same length. And again, it doesn't matter what length you choose, just pick one and go with it. Probably gonna start for a one inch rip cut and get one inch strips out of most of these pieces. Voiceover Scott here. I'm gonna let in-person Scott take over for a little while, but don't worry, I'll be back a little bit before the halfway mark. Okay, so now we have everything cut down to one inch thick strips, and I've already gone ahead and rotated them all in the same direction, uh, just so that there's evenness to it. Once I organize the pattern I want, I'm gonna rotate every other board, so if there is any bowing, it should counteract itself when it's getting glued up. The main idea here is, number one, I don't want to have the same wood touching each other, like two strips of maple or two strips of walnut. I wanna try to intersperse, I don't mind putting piece of ash in between right next to a piece of maple but trying to get a randomized uh, pattern as we go through this so I'm just gonna sit here for a while and shuffle these around and we're gonna see what we come up with in the end there's literally no rhyme or reason to this okay I think that's a fairly randomized pattern. This is definitely far too wide to fit through my planer. We're gonna make, I think, two boards out of this is what I'm gonna need. Yeah, thereabouts. Uh, we'll make two different boards out of these, about 12 and a half inches. We'll separate these out into two separate piles and create two different glue ups. That's gonna help us with the randomized pattern as we go. Next step, glue. So that finishes pass number one of who knows how many. 
So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna set the fence for the current thickness of these boards. This should give me some ability to mix and match even more so. And I'll show you that once I've done all the cuts. Also, I went ahead and switched to a ripping blade. I had some issues where I felt like some of the woods were getting bogged down, so hopefully this will help that out. But uh, I'm gonna go ahead and get on with the next set of cuts. Okay, so we got those boards ripped down into strips again, and now the idea is I can mix and match these again with their new patterns, but then also decide, well, maybe this one I wanna keep in its current orientation, but this one I wanna flip on its edge like that. The idea there is that you get just a more unique pattern. I'm gonna be spending a lot of time now just shuffling these around and trying to figure out what pattern I want to do next. And this is where you can see the chaos starting to form in here. Still don't have too many of the same piece of wood touching each other. Like right here would be kind of cool if I put a thin strip of purple heart because then you get an L shape. But I think it's too soon to start doing something like that. I may change my mind uh, before I glue all this up, um, but uh, actually, you know what? That doesn't sound like a bad idea. Let's see what it looks like at least. So we're gonna take this piece out, fit that one in its place, and keep in mind that that's just gonna get broken up even more once it's all taken care of. So there can kind of be this cool notch pattern that's put in there. Time for glue up number two. Here I'm cutting the two boards in half, so now I have four shorter boards. This will give me a couple of things. First, now I have more options for mixing around the pattern. Second, I can add shorter strips from previous projects into the boards, giving me more variety into the pattern. Here, you can see me adding larger pieces of walnut, maple, and purple heart into the mix. So the rest of this is more of the same. Glue up the newly cut strips. After drying, send the boards through the planer to get them flat. Set a new random width on the table saw to cut the new strips. And finally, place the new strips into a new pattern. I do the entire process about five times before I switch to the end grain cuts. Okay, so after six glue-ups, we finally have our final pattern that's on here. So the next things I need to do are square off the two ends to get rid of all these jaggies, and that'll let me know how much material I have to deal with in terms of uh, making 
the, the pieces to flip over for end grain. So I'm gonna do that on both of these, get both ends done, run a calculation, figure out how many strips I need to make in order to make a couple of boards out of these. I'm trying to take off the absolute minimum to square off the ends. So I make one main pass, then a second more accurate pass on each side of each board. Now I set my fence to the height I want the final cutting boards to be, uh, about an inch and a quarter. Then cross cut the boards for the final end grain pattern. These are the two boards I just Pass them through the table saw, and uh, this is going to reveal the pattern. I'm gonna, for right now, I'm just going to rotate them 90 degrees to expose the end grain pattern, and then we'll work on the mix and match. So now the idea would be to combine these two to make the final board. And the way that I see it, every piece has four orientations. There's basically one, two, three, and four. So we have plenty of ways of mixing and matching these two uh, in order to get something a little bit more random and chaotic. Right now I'm trying to see where the pattern is potentially repeating and I'm having a hard time figuring that out, which is a good thing. The less you can figure out in terms of the repeat pattern, the better off. And there we go. Two butcher block style chaotic end grain cutting boards. So now I just have to glue them up uh, and then every woodworker's favorite thing, sanding. Yay! For the final glue up, I align the boards as carefully as I can. I don't want to have to cut any more material when squaring up the final board. And we're done! <laughs> yeah, right, I wish. Um, so, these just got out of the, uh, the final glue up. They are not very flat right now. So, I have to do some sanding on these in order to make them flat. Probably not gonna get them to be completely coplanar, but flat is better than not flat. So, since it's end grain, I am not putting this thing through my planer. I've, I've heard of many people say that, oh, it's perfectly fine to throw it through. I've done it several times before. I've also seen pictures of end grain cutting boards that have exploded after they've been sent through the planer. I'm not gonna get on the debate of should you, should you not. I'm making the decision that I'm not going to, especially since I'm still using a straight blade cutter in my planer, I don't feel comfortable doing it. And it's not from a safety perspective, it's I don't want to see three and a half days of work just completely fly apart. So I'm gonna be using sanders instead. Uh, I'm going to start out with a fairly coarse sandpaper on my belt sander. I've got 50 grit and 36 grit, and so those will hopefully help me flatten these out uh, to a good degree, uh, and then we can do the rest of the sanding with the random orbital. Uh, to help with dust collection and everything like that, I've got a box fan with a filter here. Got another fan mounted up here. That's hopefully gonna give me enough of a cross breeze to help me out uh, just because it's hot. I don't wanna be uh, doing this right now, but uh, I do wanna finish this project. So that should help out a lot. And uh, plus my dust collector, while it does great with my random orbital, it doesn't exactly fit on the end of my belt sander because it's a Harbor Freight belt sander and Harbor Freight decided we're not gonna be standard. In fact, that's the dust port on the Harbor Freight sander. It's basically literally like trying to fit a square peg in a round hole. It just doesn't work. So I have to use the bag 
in order to get any type of dust collection whatsoever, but then these fans should help me out. So, <sighs> I hate sanding. Well, I love to hate sanding, let's put it that way. End grain is very difficult to sand down, especially for some of the species in this board, like the Purple Heart. The 36 grit belt I put on the sander does make quicker work of this, but it still takes a very long time. My goal is to sand until I cannot feel any transitions between the wood pieces. I'd say I spent about 45 minutes just with the belt sander to get things as smooth as I could. After smoothing, it was time to try to get these flat. This would be the perfect job for a drum sander, but those are expensive and I don't have one. So instead, I'm using a large sheet of 36 grit sandpaper on a flat piece of MDF and using good old elbow grease to knock down any high areas. If I spent about 45 minutes with the belt sander, I spent another 45 minutes with the manual flattening. I eventually get it close enough that I'm happy with the results. Here I'm squaring off the boards to their final shape. I take my time to cut off the absolute minimum off these boards. Next I round over the edges with a round over bit in my palm router. I try my best not to burn anything so I take several light passes. Since these boards are thicker than your standard boards, I wanted to make them easier to pick up. I'm clamping on a couple pieces of MDF to act as a stop for my palm router. Then I use a cove profile bit to carve in some finger holds. Once I screw in the rubber feet, the board is elevated enough that you can easily grip the board by the finger holds. All right, we are flat, squared, rounded over, and I've got the hand holes cut in. And so now, it's time for an epic sanding montage. I'm just messing with you, I'm not gonna put you through all that. Anyone who says they love sanding is either lying to you or is crazy. That being said, sanding means that you are almost at the very end of your project. I start with 80 grit, then step up until 180 grit. Before using the 180 grit though, I spray both boards with water to raise up the grain. If you sand the end grain to too high of a grit, you risk closing off the end grain. Since the next step is to soak it in mineral oil, you don't want to close the grain off or you won't be able to get the mineral oil into the wood. Time for the big finish. You see what I did there? After showing off the mineral oil pour for the obligatory oohs and ahs, I submerge the board in the oil and place a weight on it. I let the board soak for a few hours before starting the drip dry. Those popsicle sticks at the bottom help lift the board off the bottom so there aren't any air gaps. For the final coat, I use a mixture of carnauba wax and mineral oil. This stuff applies like a paste. You rub it on, let it soak in for a bit to dry, then wipe off any excess. This helps to seal in the oil that was applied inside the tub. Here I'm marking out the holes for the rubber feet. A few important things to point out. First, you must pre-drill or you risk ruining all that hard work. Second, only use stainless steel screws to prevent any rusting. Remember, these will come in contact with water. Finally, you can see me applying a small dab of glue into each hole. This isn't to secure the screws. Instead, it will act as a lubricant when the screw is installed. And once the screw is installed, the glue will help fill any voids to aid in water protection.
And with that out of the way, these boards are finished. And here is the finished end grain chaotic cutting boards. These turned out absolutely fantastic. Um, they're a little bit smaller than I originally wanted them to be, but that's because I went through as many cuts as I did. Um, there are some things that I could do next time if I wanted to improve on them. Not saying that these are bad, just saying that I could make some improvements. For one, I could get a an even thinner kerf blade for my table saw. Every pass you do is going to eat away at more material. I have a 30 gallon uh, garbage bag full of all of the planer shavings and sawdust from making all these boards. So that's a lot of wood shavings that could have been incorporated had I, um, had I put in a thinner kerf blade. I've also seen people use a bandsaw for making their rip cuts because on a bandsaw you can get an even thinner blade. So that could be one improvement that I would want to make to these just so that I'm not wasting so much material. Um, also maybe doing a little bit more with the pattern. I love the pattern. I love the way this looks. Uh, but you never know what, you know, there's always those what if moments. What if I decided to cut smaller strips or thicker strips? You know, it's... That's the beauty of these is there is no right answer, there is no wrong answer. But I absolutely love the way that these turned out and uh, <clears throat> hopefully you do as... <clears throat> but I absolutely loved the way that these turned out and uh, hopefully you do too. If you happen to like the video, give it a thumbs up and uh, be sure to comment below what you liked about the design and what you might change about it. If you haven't already subscribed to my channel, please do so, and uh, be sure to hit the bell icon to get notifications when I post new videos. Until next time, thanks for joining me in my shop.